Welcome to Talk Purpose and Truth, shifting you into higher consciousness, a show that elevates, uplifts, and encourages listeners to grow, heal, awaken, and evolve. Eden and Kim include bold topics, interviews with inspiring guests, experts, and celebrities, intuitive readings, channeled messages, mental health awareness, and hot topics to expand your awareness. Tune in for unprecedented truth, authenticity, on-purpose discussions, and magical moments. So, Tina Guo is a Grammy Award-nominated and Brit Female Artist of the Year-nominated musician who has established an international career as a virtuoso acoustic electric cellist multi-instrumentalist, composer, and entrepreneur. You have heard her most recently on the soundtrack of Dune. Her latest solo album, I'm going to say it wrong, probably D.S. Iray, hopefully I said it right, was released in, (laughs) she'll correct me if I didn't, was released in (laughs) August 2021 on Sony Masterworks. A self-managed artist, Tina is passionate about investing, financial planning, and self-actualization. We love that. Mm -hmm. She also directs, produces, and edits most of her own music videos and offers career consultations to other creatives, encompassing sustainable career growth, branding, wealth-building, stage performance, and being hands-on in today's music business climate. Outside of music, Tina loves to spend time with her two fur babies, pizza and bagel. So cute. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she is passionate about coffee, traveling, nature, and anything high tech. Welcome, Tina. Thank you so much for having me. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I know you me, and now I'm like, I don't remember if I pronounced that correctly. How do you say it? Oh, uh, uh, DS Ray is the album. Is that what you were asking about? Yeah, I just didn't yes. remember if I said it correctly. <laughs> that's, a, that's okay. That's okay. It's uh, Latin for the yeah. day of wrath. <laughs> oh, that's kind of scary. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, scary. Well, scary is great. well, Dune, isn't that what the movie's kind of similar? It matches the movie. Oh. Dune or... <laughs> well, where did that... So tell us about your upbringing and how you got started, and then maybe you can kind of add in what that album title means. I mean, why, why you chose it. Sure, sure. Um, so I uh, was born in China in the year 1985, uh, and I was raised by very, very conservative, traditional Chinese, obviously, um, classical musician parents. So um, I've, I've talked about it before a lot, and I don't, I sometimes I tend to talk too much, so I will try to be as concise as possible. Um, but it was really an upbringing that was honestly super limited in what I was exposed to musically, life-wise, um, and pretty much I was raised like in a boot camp. Um, and I, I was required uh, to say that nicely. I was required to practice eight hours a day every day, sometimes 10 hours a day from wow. uh, when I started the cello at age seven. Um, mm. So I was groomed, you know, really wow. to be a musician. Um, and so that was kind of the way that it started. And, and to be honest, um, I'm sure you, you know, you've talked to so many amazing musicians and I think a lot of them, music was a passion. It was something that they wanted to do themselves. For me, I'm not sure if it's something I wanted to do myself because I didn't really have a choice. Um, so it actually started off as a very, um, I, don't, I wouldn't even say love hate. It was more like eh, hate <laughs> relationship, mm-hmm. honestly, because it was so much, um, pressure, you know, and, and to not truly have a life outside of music for the first 18 years of my life. Um, and it really wasn't until I left home at 18, I attended USC for a classical cello performance. Um, and I was able to, I guess like, you know, my eyes and my you know mind was open to other things outside of what I was ex- exposed to. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I have, I do have um, the skill set, you know, just purely from being forced to practice for so many hours that I can now apply like take and apply to be able to express my own passion and other things um so it, it ended up working out um so that's really just the honest truth about my musical background um and then ds ray uh released on sony masterworks is my second album and i honestly never i didn't even think i would ever be signed to a label let alone a major label so previous to that i self-released self-produced 10 albums um wow. and so this is my second on uh sony and i'm just really really 
truly grateful, especially with, you know, how the music business is now to even have yeah. that opportunity, you know, um, and uh, there's 13 tracks. My favorite number is 13. Um, <laughs> the the album conceptually is set uh, in the year 3000 uh, in space. And, wow. um, and the very last track, which uh, I mean, I love you know all the tracks that we were able to do for the album, but the very last one features Serge, uh, the singer of System of a Down. So oh, that was yeah. my first. Yeah, it was my first uh, collaboration with a vocalist, believe it or not, you know, after that many albums. Um, and it was amazing to be able to work with him um, all remotely because it was done during COVID. Uh, and then to be able to shoot, you know, a music video for that. So, you know, if anyone's curious to see uh, <laughs> this very random mishmash, they can check it out on YouTube or wherever. It's on wow. YouTube. And then how about your album? How do they find that? Yeah, it's on all uh, all digital retailers worldwide. So my, if you just okay. type in my name, um, you can find that and all of my other, you know, previous musical experimentations and releases. Wow, okay. how cool! And that's so great. Your first, um, your first person that you worked with is actually very well known. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I remember. Um, you know, I wasn't allowed to listen to other types of. Music, uh, growing up, but I do remember a couple times in like carpools on the way uh, to and from middle school. I don't know why I just remember this very specifically. Twin Peaks Middle School, driving down the street, System of a Down was really big in Lincoln Park, you know, in that era, um, and I loved them. I'm like, oh my god, this is so cool! It's so like it kind of ethnic and dark and heavy, um, and so it really was um, surreal and amazing to be able to you know collaborate with uh, with him. Oh wow! And you manifested it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm very big on, on uh, manifestation, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> we are too. You're yeah. on the right show. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. I know, <laughs> I know. We talk about that probably on every sh every episode. We talk about that. Um, you're very, you seem very confident in yourself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you think, do you feel like you're confident? You know, I... Uh, so right now, um, it's actually perfect that I think I'm on this podcast, you know, because... I, I feel like the first, I'm 36, the first 35 and a half um, years of my life have been purely devoted to my career. Um, and I, and I, again, I didn't, I feel like I had no choice. It was kind of like determined for me. And I just kept going down that path. Um, and then as far as like, you know, uh, I think on a, on a business sense, career sense, um, I've been able to manifest, work mm -hmm. for, achieve like a lot of the, most of the goals that I had set, you know, back in the day, what, 15 years ago when I started. Um, and I, I realized very recently that there are some parts of me, I mean, obviously, you know, the way that I describe my upbringing is in a very soft manner, very generalized, um, but there was a lot of trauma, a lot of childhood trauma, you know, that I think I buried in achievement, financial success, you know, career, like all of that stuff that I think is sadly pretty common. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've realized, uh, <laughs> yeah, very, very recently that I do have uh, these issues that I have not fully uh, dived into. Like I, I only started seeing or speaking to a therapist for the first time less than a year ago. Um, and so now uh, I've, I'm really, really focusing on that. So to answer your question, I feel like yeah. overall, generally, I am confident. Like I'm, you know, I'm, happy about life. I'm grateful for so many things in my life. Um, but I, I did realize that the one area where my confidence seems to disappear into a pool of anxious attachment style um, is, is definitely in romantic relationship. And, and that uh, has unfortunately manifested itself over and over again in these like repeated patterns. And it's something that, you know, better late than never, but after, you know, 35 years, I'm like, okay, there's one area of my life that I don't seem to have quite um, figured out. So that's something that I'm working on. So I, I don't know if that's a lack of confidence, but I think it's more of just um, really questioning myself because I think that's hard to do, to be brutally honest with yourself and, and ask, am I messed up, you know, a little bit? Am I damaged in some way? Is there something I need to change? Um, so yeah, that would be, I guess, I'm, I'm yes, and, and working on it. So. Yeah, well, I think that goes along with um, value, self-worth, Mm -hmm. um acceptance things like that or I think the way you grew up it sounds like everything was done for you or told this is how you should feel and this is how you should be and live you know and so then there there was no space for you to figure out who you are 
Um, so now you're learning, you're getting to learn that now at this age, it's not too late. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah. you seem, you do seem confident though, it, for, for what you went through and, you know, look at you, you just, what you've accomplished on your own. And it sounds like, I hope you're making your decisions now on your, on your own and yes. you're happy with yourself. You're happy with your choices. So you are, you, you've really come a long way. That's what it sounds like. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think it, um, it came, you know, a lot of my drive also came from just wanting uh, so badly to break out of like the chains, you know, cause I felt yeah. I spent so many years feeling so repressed in every way, you know? And, um, and I think, for me, the way what I saw freedom, a key to freedom is success, to be honest, you know, to not have to depend on other people to not um, have to struggle as I think a lot of people do, especially musicians. Um, and so I think now that that area of my life because you know, how, how much success is enough success? How much money is enough money? You know, how, how, how much do I need in my stock market portfolio? It's like, at, at, at some point, you realize it's never going to be enough, you know, because there are other things um, that need to be worked on, I think that are a little bit uh, deeper, and I think more difficult. Um, and it's funny, I, I always say, again, because of the way that I was raised, like almost uh, in a very robotic manner where I, like my feelings, my desires didn't matter. It was just, you're going to do this, and this is what you do. And the purpose of your life is to be successful and to bring honor upon the family. Like it's very you know, that's what it is. And, uh, yeah, it's like, I'm having my, my second, uh, childhood, maybe up, like whatever it is like now trying to reparent myself, um, and, and figure, figure out like a good balance. Mm -hmm. Like a rebirth. Right. It's really common. Um, I, I had a spiritual mentor for years and he taught me that you go through a seven year shift every seven years and 35 mm -hmm. is a very common age to go through like, a kind of deepening of your spirituality, your intuition, your knowing of yourself. And all of a sudden you're just launched onto this path of doing that. And you can't not do it because you're just pulled to it. And, um, I think that it's great because the more we can admit, you know, we're messy, we're imperfect. We have things that we can heal. Then you're going to feel freer and happier. And then your work's going to be even more joyful to you. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You know, we have an episode, um, you made me think of it, um, attachment style, um, mm -hmm. Thais Gibson, she's an expert on attachment style, and we did an episode with her, like, about a, maybe 10 months ago or something like that, so if you if you well, scroll back, you can find it, it was very good. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. definitely check that out. <laughs> so, on to more about your performing. So, I'm going to name a few of the amazing performances that really stand out to us among many you've performed with Foo Fighters at the Grammys I love Foo Fighters mm -hmm. from 2011 to 2013 as the featured electric cellist with Circus Soleil's Michael Jackson the Immortal World Tour and we love Michael Jackson mm -hmm. as well as with globally famous symphony orchestras and you've been featured on the Ellen DeGeneres show playing Beat It on the electric cello and performed at the American Country Music Awards with Carrie Underwood on Dancing with the Stars with Carlos Santana and India Irie. I think I remember seeing you on that. Oh, my gosh. I think so, too. Yeah, me yeah, too. Yeah, I love it. Um, <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel Live with Ellie Goulding and the MTV Awards, American Idol, the Sold Out Staple Center, and more. What has this been like? And can you tell us about some of your standout moments? Like, what are the ones that really stand out and bring back that feeling for you oh my goodness um it's funny it's like when I uh, of, of course I, I I remember you know every performance but sometimes you know life goes on and you kind of like for, forget you know and not not that I take it for granted but just listening to you you know read over some of those I'm like oh yeah yeah <laughs> I, 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 should be, I, <laughs> I should be confident I should be confident yeah. because look at all <laughs> that I've done <laughs> And it's like, okay, I've done, you know, I've done stuff and I'm great, again, grateful for those experiences, you know? Um, uh, so, okay. Uh, my most, oh my gosh, it's, it's very difficult to choose between all your babies, of course, right. Or all the yeah. experiences. I think, um, 
for, for me, uh, on like a larger scale, I would say the very first show opening night in Montreal um, at the uh, arena. So it was, I think, 35,000 people um, with the Cirque du Soleil, the Michael Jackson show that you mentioned. That was my very first time. So th it was uh, in 2011. It was my very first time playing in an arena setting um, like featured, you know, I had done some smaller gigs and stuff like that before as a member of like a backing orchestra, but to be like front, like more of a featured musician. Um, and I just remember like sticking my head out <laughs> of the back and seeing all those people and feeling that um, nervousness, you know, which you can transmute into excitement, of course, because it's a similar feeling. Um, but I just remember feeling like, oh my, oh my God, this is insane. I've, I've, dreamed about this and to be able to do it on the electric cello um because because you know i dabble in a lot of different kinds of music but for me heavy metal industrial metal is my passion now michael it. yeah michael jackson is not metal obviously no. but <laughs> um but but the way that i my character was in the show uh it was actually an alien with half my head shaved you know i have one butt cheek hanging out covered in Swarovski crystals uh oh, wow. and the way that i played was very aggressive it was like distorted heavy electric cello so it sounded like a guitar um and i i did feel like okay i, I was able to manifest you know with my just pure obsession and in, in my hope of being able to do this with uh with the cello and to break free of um the classical world not that there's anything wrong with the classical world i still play classical music um and so that was very memorable and then the other extremely memorable uh moment so for about five or six years after i moved to los angeles uh to go to school um you know it was definitely a struggle like things did not <laughs> were not working i think i had maybe six or seven failed band projects i mean i was just i was doing uh, i was getting all of my gigs off of craigslist um mm -hmm. i was playing for like literally 20 to 40 dollars per per night to barely cover parking or gas or sometimes it wouldn't um just with different like anybody who would pay um just to get experience you know to to play music that wasn't what i was raised in which is you know classical recitals you know symphony halls um and so I uh, was short on rent, you know, one month and I was like super desperate. And I remember <laughs> this one person sent me a message in response to my Craigslist ad saying, oh, you know, I wanted, I want to, um, I want to hire you for a private gig, you know, at my, at my condo. <laughs> and I want to propose to my girlfriend. Aww. And it's like, you know, so it, it was very sweet. And um, I did not have a cell phone at the time because I couldn't afford a cell phone. So it was only by email. So, uh, and I drove out there. I forgot where it was like super far up north. I was living in a dorm, sharing a dorm with somebody at USC in downtown. So I drove all the way up there. It took like an hour to get there. Uh, and then when I got there, like I didn't even think at the time, like, oh, nobody knows where I am. I don't have a cell phone. I didn't yeah. tell anyone where I was going. So it could have gone badly. I mean, obviously I'm alive now, so everything was okay. But <laughs> um, but I, I got there and he's like, oh, can you, do you mind hiding in the closet? And I said, you want me to hide in the closet? He's like, yeah, well, I don't want her to know that you're here. So if you could take out your cello and then hide in the closet, then when she comes home from work and goes upstairs to shower, which is like her routine, um, I want you to like come, but like have the cello ready. So you're going to jump out of the closet and oh then God. start playing. And then I'm going to get down on one knee and it's going to be so great. And which I, and I thought, okay, cool, whatever. Um, and she ended up uh, being late. So oh. I was, I mean, I think I'm, I don't know exactly how long it was because, again, I didn't have a phone, but at least like 20 minutes, which kind of seems like an eternity in a tiny coat closet that was like yeah. black. Um, <laughs> and, and, and oh my God, in those 20 minutes, I, I suddenly realized, oh my God, what if this is the end of my life? Yeah. <laughs> what if this is like, <laughs> um, and so, and eventually she did come home. I jumped out. I played the Bach prelude. She said yes. He paid me fifty dollars, and then I got back in the car and drove back an hour to downtown LA. And I, you know, I've told that story a few times, but honestly, like I can, you know, I can talk about you know arenas, stadiums, or being able to play at Vacuum uh, in 2019. Uh, that honestly was probably one of my career highlights, playing at in front of a hundred thousand people at like a oh my gosh. Big metal festival. But I still have to say that that gig from Craigslist and hiding in the closet, I think that is my most memorable um, because <laughs> I actually felt like I might die. <laughs> yeah, you'll oh never forget God. that. <laughs> I will never forget that. No. Wow. Wait, so you played at a metal, like a heavy metal festival in Europe? Yes, yes. So uh, Vakin is the biggest metal festival in the world, and I was um, able to perform there. So I, 
they have all these like different uh, villages and stages. And so I played at the gaming village because my first album uh, released on Sony is called Game On. And it's like my my renditions of a bunch of like amazing uh, video game music. There's so much great music from games. Uh, some of it was very heavy, like the metal stuff. So that's what I was performing. And because I was there, the label reached out to the other artists who were performing on the main stage and asked, I, I, I was almost like, are you sure? I, I'm like shy, I'm like embarrassed. I, don't, I wouldn't do that myself. But they said, no, 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 we're gonna reach out to the other artists and see if anybody wants to collab with you. I'm like, okay, I, I really didn't expect anything to happen. But um, two, two of the uh, band so Beyond the Black, which is a German uh, metal band, and then Sabaton, you know, this incredible band. Um, so they, Sabaton was having like a special double stage, so two main stage show, uh, and they both performed on the same day. But anyway, they both bands were like, yeah, we want Tina to play with us. So I was able to uh, have like a little, you know, two or three songs featured with both of those projects, and that was really really a lot of fun that was definitely uh -huh. pure pure passion for the music that was not and how does it feel <laughs> to be in front of that many people um it felt i don't i don't know what the right word is but it's like I, for, for me um it's like perform, performing is a it's an energy exchange you know and i think um when i when i practice you know all those years spent practicing when i practice at home i think of it as i'm training my physical body because it's a it's a vessel right so i'm training it to uh, to be able to do things manually physically that need to be done in order to express emotion because for, for me at least in the end that's what it is i think if you're um a musician and you can sure you can play a lot of notes you know anyone who practices whatever that many hours you can play a lot of notes but if there's no feeling or passion or emotion behind it um i i, I personally don't resonate with that so i think um when you're when, when there's that many people and everyone's completely just in the moment and just it's like you're high together just on you know, <laughs> on energy. a natural, just, it, it's pure energy. And I, 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 like, for me, it's like the bigger the audience is, the more I feel like the cycle of, um, yeah, it's like spirit or energy passing through. And then I'm able to like project it. And it's like a, uh, and if it's, you know, a nice audience, that's not just standing there like, what is she doing? <laughs> it's, it's a, no, it's such a, oh my God, it's, it's, one of the best feelings in the world, I think, for 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 everybody. You know, it's a very uh, circular uh, experience. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing, and just it's just extraordinary that you've been able to experience that. And then to think you went like I love how you just told the story about a closet <laughs> for fifty bucks, and then you tell a hundred thousand people. And what was that like between only how many years later? Like what um, eight years or something? No, I mean, that 2019, the closet, I think, <laughs> was 2008, maybe, eight or nine, so yeah. no, little, 11 years. Isn't um, that crazy? It, like, I think that's such an example of what, you know, people get so, like, oh, what's the use? Oh, you know, what's going to happen? And look at what you went from. You know, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think anything anything is possible as long as you have enough um, obsessive obsessive uh, manifestation, but also active, you know, uh, action to bring that manifestation into reality for sure. Yeah, that's for mm -hmm. sure. You have, it's so exciting. A lot of what you're talking about has to feel so exciting. How do you stay grounded, you know, in between times and, you know, down to earth? How, how do you do that with all that excitement? Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like, like for me, um, I'm not sure if this is the right, you know, I, I'm sorry, I have so many thoughts right now going through my head, but I, I've never been drunk. I've never tried almost, well, okay, I've tried marijuana, but like other substances. I think I'm just, for whatever reason, um, it's not even how I was raised particularly. I'm just really into not as much as possible, not putting things, I think, in my body. Again, I don't judge, you know, what anybody does, of course, but um, that alter my state, my, my own state of consciousness. Yeah. Um, and I try to get into that high state just through through art through music through sex through like you know all of the things that we have at our disposal mm -hmm. um that are already amazing um but as far as like being grounded uh i do love yoga you know so i try yeah. to start every day um because i realize if i don't 
have a morning routine where I do the most important things for myself. And this is something I established or reestablished very recently. Um, I think, you know, having to do with my whole, you know, questioning existential crisis, questioning my existence thing going on. Um, but I realize if I don't practice the cello, but purely for myself, not, not for, you know, uh, a, a soundtrack, because now I do a lot of remote recording, especially with the pandemic, um, for projects and stuff, which is great. But that's not the same thing as playing music for yourself. It's like when you have something that uh, is a form of expression and art and passion, but somehow at the same time, it's also your job. Sometimes I think it gets mixed and it can get a little bit, um, stain is not the right word, but there's also a lot of stress and other stuff that's logistical that's attached to it. Yeah. Um, so now I, I get up in the morning. I always, this is kind of weird, but I drink coffee and do yoga at the same time, not in downward dog, <laughs> but like I will, I will do my coffee yoga for an hour and then I'll, I'll practice for at least an hour, just, you know, whatever, like not for any purpose you know I think that was one thing I realized everything I did I, I like became like my parents or how I was raised like I had to have like a end goal like why am I doing this it's so I can you know record this so I can make money so it, everything was very um not contrived but just like there's like a there has to be a reason for it and I realized that's not healthy you know to, to be like that 100 percent. so you know this morning i just randomly picked a couple of classical pieces i noodle around a little bit and i know if i at least get those two things down and i walk my dogs um then no matter what happens the rest of the day i will still feel grounded because you know what happens if you don't do the most important things in the morning there's things just come up and oops you know yeah <laughs> and then you get tired so true very yeah. very true yeah. okay Thank you for listening to Talk Purpose and Truth podcast. Find out more at talkpurposeandtruth.com. And follow us at Talk Purpose Truth on Instagram and Facebook.